Dr. Jayantu Bosch, who is, I am presume, a PhD, who is a part of the group today, is the passion for the subject that he has pursued in the in his PhD thesis. I may be intelligent to know about that subject, but I may not have that passion and persistent to pursue a PhD uh, qualification. So that passion comes out of many elements. The question that we will try to answer to all of us is, how does one judge the passion of a team member, of a senior, of another individual? So what are the points? Sumit, let's pick it up from there. So the first point which we look at passion, the way I have used it over these years, is how is the person approaching the task? Is the person approaching the task in a manner where that person wants to be in control of the task? Or is he approaching the task in a manner that I have to do it, let me do it. That's point one. Second, what I look for passion is belief in self. Is the person believing that he can do what is expected of him? Is she believing that, yes, this is possible for me? I mean, a lot of times I have found that uh, we men may think that, all right, this is not, this is where women are better than us in this particular role. And therefore, we should not do it. Let me give an example. I think a classic example is the profession of nursing. I mean, we have seen, or rather at least I have been brought, born and brought up during an era where I never saw a male nurse. My mother herself was a nurse. But today, if you see, that glass ceiling has been broken. And a lot of male nurses are there in all hospitals. Nursing is a different type of a role. It's a different type of a profession. It has got a different purpose. And men, some men believe that yes, they can do it. That's a belief in self. Third is a very important point from my side. I have found a lot of people comply because boss has said to do so. That person cannot be working with passion. It's a, if it is a unless the person himself is committed to what the person has to do or the performance that he needs to achieve, that person will not be passionate about the work. It is being done because I have to do it. So there is a reluctance, but I, you know, these people are not that they are defying you. They will do it. They will do it the way you want them to do, but it is not coming from within. It is being done because after it's another tick mark in the task that he has to do. That is not passion. The passion comes in and that is why you will find a lot of people overdo or add to the brief that you give for a task. Discipline. And discipline is not about coming to work and going out of one time. No. That's some basic level of discipline. Discipline comes in terms of what you are supposed not to do. That is the first discipline. Second, discipline comes where in terms of how you prepare yourself. Let me give an example from a cricketer called Rahul Dravid. There is a book which is about him, Rahul Dravid. And then his wife, she mentions in an interview that Rahul Dravid as a person, and we all know, is not bothered about many things in life. But so far, the cricket bat is concerned, even decimal ounce here and there, he will be bothered. Point one. Point two. He says that when the family has traveled with him on the overseas tours, the night before the match starts, he will just lock himself up in the room and he will not interact with anybody. That is perhaps a discipline that he has inculcated to prepare, to focus on the task at hand, on the performance there. Another discipline from the same book, Dravid has a unique record of having faced the maximum number of deliveries in test cricket. Nobody has got that record across the world. So he says one of the disciplines that he has followed is it cannot be that a bowler will not beat you on to a, a great delivery or you make a mistake in playing a delivery. The idea is discipline is switch on, switch on, switch on, switch on. How do you switch on when the bowler starts running and how do you switch up between the deliveries being done? This is a discipline. Enthusiasm, I suppose, makes it for everything else that we have in life. If you have read that book <coughs> by Barack Obama, 
on his biography, he talks of how his enthusiasm helped him to break the glass ceiling in Harvard in his law school. And he says that enthusiasm makes up for many other things in life. I have always preferred team members who may be less, little less skillful, but high on enthusiasm and discipline than team members who are highly skillful, but very poor on discipline and enthusiasm. To me, consistency of performance depends a lot on that energy. And this needs no explanation, I presume. You know people who bring in energy. And energy does not mean that you talk a lot. Energy comes in from people who are also extremely silent. But you can feel the energy when they do something, the way they approach, the way they look at work, people with a lot of concentration. So the energy has many dimensions. And for example, if you look at those who are these IT geeks, I mean, their energy is they don't talk. They are like, they are fixated to the screen doing hundreds of things and, and, and oblivious to the entire world. That's a different type of an energy that they bring in. And you can see that. The last thing, I mean, the one of point after that is very important. If you look at the trapeze artists in a circus who jump from one side and go and join the other, could they have done it so comfortably if there was the net was not there downstairs? I'm sure they would not. Have, however skillful you are, so one of the key things that we must imbibe in our people is what is called failure insurance. That you try it, put in your best, success is yours. I will manage your failure. And you will be able to, I mean, you know, this is what triggers passion. If I know that my boss, Arun, if I may use the word boss, is with me even if I fail, I will put in that much more in whatever I am doing. And I'll try and do things which we have never done before. And I'll do and innovate. I will try and do things which, which, which we may not have done before and which could be very differentiated from whatever we are doing. And of course, the last point on this slide is mutual agreement on goal. You know, often we give people a goal which the person doesn't buy into. If the buy-in is not there, the passion will not. Often what happens, people do not know what they are capable of. So therefore, one of my favorite topic is that there is no word called overachievement. If I run, let's say, don't believe me, run a hundred meter race in 20 seconds, and after one year of what I call deliberate practice, I am able to run it 19 seconds. I have not overachieved. I have improved my performance. My potential was perhaps always there to run it at 15, but I was doing at 20. Through deliberate practice, through enthusiasm, through energy, through this, everything that I have written about passion, I have been able to achieve more than what I have achieved up till now. So we never overachieve. Overachievement is a myth. It is all about taking our performance, own performance to the next level. The question is, how many people realize what is their potential? How can one estimate it? That is where the biggest challenge lies. And as managers, as team leaders, one has to help people to achieve more than what they have done. And you will see that as the achievement takes place, the higher goals will become mutually agreeable as we go forward.